ATP is necessary for all of our life functions and is pretty much one of the only forms of energy our cell uses for various and multiple processes. ATP is used for almost everything, from pumping molecules across a cell membrane to giving you the energy for running that marathon. The reason why ATP has so much energy is because of the three phosphate groups attached to it. ATP actually stands for adenosine triphosphate, with the tri meaning that there are three phosphate groups attached. When ATP is used, it basically breaks into a single phosphate group and ADP. ADP is adenosine diphosphate, and the di part means that there are now two phosphate groups. Back to why ATP holds so much energy, do you see how these three phosphate groups all have a negative charge? These negative charges repel one another, and it takes a whole lot of energy to keep them together like this in one ATP molecule. The energy represented when holding these groups together shows how much energy a molecule of ATP really has. Here's a diagram of the structure of ATP for you. It has a ribose sugar, an adenine base, and the three phosphate groups. In addition, we'll be going over what enzymes are in this video. Enzymes are actually proteins that catalyze reactions, meaning that chemical reactions can get started faster. They don't actually make the reaction time faster, they just make them happen sooner than they would. Think about it like this. You want to get away from school as soon as possible to get a nap. Well, driving a car would get you home faster, but you'd still take a nap afterwards and set your alarm for, say, three hours. On the other hand, if you walked home, you would get home later, but you would still set your alarm for three hours after the nap had started. Enzymes are like the car. They don't speed up the reaction, they just make it start faster than they normally would. This entire thing means that they lower the energy of activation barrier. Now what is that? Energy of activation stands for the amount of energy a chemical reaction needs to start. By lowering this barrier, enzymes decrease the amount of energy needed so chemical reactions can begin sooner. Here's a typical graph you would see regarding enzymes and energy of activation. This is the original energy of activation, but now the enzyme lowers it so that the amount of energy needed is less. Now the reaction can happen much sooner. Enzymes also are extremely specific and can only work on certain substrates. Substrates are the molecules that enzymes work with. Enzymes do not get consumed or changed after the reaction. Once the reaction happens, the enzyme reverts back to its original form. When the enzyme does change like this when the substrate attaches to it, this is called the induced fit model. The substrate latches onto the active site and the enzyme closes around it and fits it better. As you can see, when the reaction finishes, the enzyme goes back to its normal shape. Some enzymes even make ATP by a process called substrate level phosphorylation. In this process, an enzyme can actually transfer a phosphate group from one substrate onto another ADP molecule. Furthermore, there are these other molecules called cofactors and coenzymes. Some enzymes need these molecules in order to function properly. Cofactors and coenzymes help the enzyme through many ways, perhaps through being the raw materials for a reaction or changing the enzyme's shape slightly. Coenzymes are organic enzyme helpers, and cofactors are not. Finally, a common idea that's repeated a lot in AP biology is the fact that proteins and enzymes can become denatured in the presence of high or low temperatures and pH. Other variables can influence the naturing too, like high salt solutions. Denaturing simply means that the protein kind of unravels and becomes non-functioning. Let's take a look at these graphs. This graph shows the optimal temperature of a certain enzyme found in an organism that thrives in a hot spring. As you can see, on the left side of this graph, the rate of the reaction slowly rises and reaches a peak at the optimal temperature, which is extremely high. It's important to notice that lower temperatures don't have as detrimental of an effect as high temperatures. They mostly just slow the rate of the reaction down. You can see this at the right of the graph, where there's a steep decline because of how hot it's getting for the protein. If the enzyme denatures from high temperatures, it simply can't function. The last graph we'll look at today is this pH graph. It's very similar to the temperature graph, and this is showing the optimal pH of a stomach enzyme. Of course, the stomach is very acidic, so it would make sense that the optimal pH of this protein is very low. Any pH value that is too high or too low can also denature enzymes, making them unable to function. So I hope you guys liked this video, and that's all for today. Thanks for watching, and be sure to check out my other AP Biology videos.